Okay, so first we're going to do a little uh, history of the Android Common Kernel. Back in, in 2016 and before, the, the, the Android Common Kernels, which we created from the upstream LTSs, were basically patch repositories. Nobody actually used them in production. We didn't actually do a lot of testing with it. What, the, the, what happened back then was that the common kernel was cloned by a silicon, uh, you know, one of the silicon providers, and they added all their stuff to it, and then they passed it on to their customers, the OEMs, who added their stuff to it, and in the end, we, end, we had kernels out there, kind of an individual customized kernel for just about every device. Um, we started to have stronger opinions in 2017, and, and especially we were looking at security issues at the time. And so we, uh, we worked with upstream maintainers, in particular Greg, and got the upstream lifetime of the kernels, uh, the support lifetimes extended to uh, six years, starting with 4.4. And we started internally doing LTS updates, and the first one was Pixel in, in 2017. And we observed that when, when security issues came in and reported to our security team and reported in our Android security bulletin, that 93% of those things, exploits, that, that were out there in the Android community, had 93% had already been fixed on Pixel by taking LTSs and keeping it up to date with the LTSs. And phones, of course, are very uh, attractive targets because you have a lot of personal information. And so we decided that we need to take a very proactive approach and not wait for exploits to happen on Android and instead get in front of them um, by merging LTSs. So then we started requiring LTS updates starting with 5.4 for everybody in the industry. And that was quite painful because Every phone had its own individual kernel. Um, and, and so that was one of the precursors to what we do now, which is GKI, where we actually ship a binary. where We do all of that work to, to do the LTS updates, to, to track the stable kernels. And our partners just take that binary. They do their own testing with their drivers and ship the binary as is. So, it's, so the APK is, is now it is product, we do a lot of testing, our partners do a lot of testing with it. So you have well-tested uh, kernels that are tracking upstream. Uh-oh, now what happened? There's a speaking problem up here. Okay, well, okay, but, all right. Okay, okay that's, that's good. I'll call you back up in a, in a minute or two. Uh, okay, so the lifetime that we had with the six-year upstream lifetime was that we would create our ACK kernel shortly after the upstream kernel was. So in my example here, 414 um, was created in 2017. Um, and, and then the silicon vendors immediately take that, do their work, and then they typically have the first release late, late that year, and then the next year, they, the, the silicon never had to change kernel major version. It would stay on that same uh, 414 kernel. They would do their premium devices the first year, and then they would do mid-range devices and low-end devices and other derivatives the following years. And, and then after the third year, they would, they would have new launches, and then those devices would have, say, a three, three and a half year lifetime, and then they would, they would be end of life, and all of that fit within that six years. So, so it kind of worked. That's, that's kind of how we got to the six year, and it kind of worked. And now the scary part, I'm gonna try to go to another slide. Okay, so I'll just keep talking and we'll see if we can get more slides. Um, so what, what was observed, however, by, 
by the upstream maintainers was that there was zero engagement on these old kernels after a few years. So for years five and six in particular, there was no upstream folks doing any testing. There wasn't the, the stable kernels weren't getting much testing. Even in the Android community where those devices were out there in production, nobody was paying attention. Nobody was, was reporting issues back to stable. And so the upstream maintainers, Greg and Sasha and others said, look, this isn't working. We're not, we're not, we're, we're kidding ourselves. We're not really getting the, the uh, protection against exploits and so on on these really old kernels, so we're not gonna maintain them so long. And, and so if you look at kernel.org now, and what's circled on the slide <laughs> is that 5.15 is gonna have a five-year lifetime, 6.1 is down to four years, and 6.6 is, is three years. Um, and, and so the, the whole way that the Android ecosystem worked kind of gets broken by that. Um, and you'll notice on the far right column, this is all public now. We published the end of life dates. We didn't used to do that. We recently started. So you can find this online. But uh, since we promised our partners that 515 and 61 would be six years, we are going to keep it alive and do our best. But it's, you know, same, same comment. It really is, we're fooling ourselves a bit by thinking we can do a great job of that. But we are going to support those for, for six years. And... Huh? Try using the side arrow. The, this one? Ah, okay. Okay, so the way things are now is with the 612 kernel, it's going to have a four year lifetime by Android. So we don't know yet exactly what the upstream is going to be, but um, Greg is working with that with us to at least keep it for four years. And, and so we'll have device launches. Uh, and the, that first device that launches can do upgrade, upgrade, and if it was going to stay with the old cadence of a three-year lifetime, then that works, but only for that first year. And of course, Qualcomm and the other silicon vendors want to keep launching devices with their silicon and, and make money on it. So, so something's got to give because we're going to hit the kernel end of lives before device end of lives. And, and kind of to... Uh, make it even more complex. You have things like the EU uh, Eco Design Directive, which says that you have to keep giving feature and security updates for five years after you're no longer sending it out into the channel. Um, and so, so devices are definitely gonna be lasting a lot longer than the kernel lifetime. And so what now is gonna be happening and is sort of the next evolution of the the Android common kernel is that devices are going to be updated with the major, with new major kernel versions in the field as part of OTAs. Um, and, and so we're gearing up, we're doing a lot of work to make that smoother and working with our industry partners because it's a big change, you know, especially for OEMs who often have been used to kind of shipping it and never thinking about it again, now having to do some real engineering on these devices that they don't make that much money on. So there's some big ecosystem problems that we're working through with folks right now. Um, and, but, but what we're not doing is we're not letting them run with end of life kernels because we, we consider those guaranteed to be vulnerable because nobody's looking at them. Nobody's paying bounty hunters to find issues. Um, so only the bad guys are, are looking at those and trying to, to, to find stuff. So, one of the other things we're doing now is we're starting to enforce end of life. So when, when partners want to uh, upgrade the security to get a new security patch level so that they can show their users that they're maintaining their device, if they're running an end of life kernel, the, the, the test that validates that you're secure, the STS test will fail and the SPL cannot advance. And so we're forcing the hand that uh, their hand to have to do up revs. Um, one thing that's nice from an ecosystem point of view with that is for the first time, really, our partners, our silicon partners and OEMs have a strong incentive to upstream things because now they're going to have to go back and get their drivers, get their, their products working on a newer kernel version. They can't just 
abandon the old one and go on to the new one for their new silicon. They have to actually support their old silicon on the new kernels along with their new devices. Um, so we think GKI helps with that because at, at, you know, at the abstract level, all they're doing is going from one GKI kernel to another GKI kernel. That should work, it's all supported. And the complexity then is their drivers, the, the, the drivers that implement the SOC features and the drivers from the OEMs that implement the board features. Um, that's where all the complexity in this is. And so if they have their drivers upstream, they get a lot for free. They don't, they don't get the performance and power tuning for free, but they get at least a lot of the maintenance for free. And if they're tracking mainline with their devices, they get a lot of that easier. Um, and, and so this is, this is kind of a function to help incent them to upstream their drivers so that we have fewer and fewer out of tree drivers. That's one of the dynamics we're gonna see, but we're not gonna completely get rid of out of tree drivers. In fact, I think we'll still be dominated by out of tree drivers for a lot of the silicon. So we do have a bunch of support, a DDK to help with that as well, to make it easy to switch between kernel versions with your drivers. You can maintain a driver, you can compile it against multiple upstream kernels and, and deal with the portability things. And then, of course, they still have to deal with the, the power and, and uh, performance tuning. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is, so we have a few of our partners who've already done this a couple of times, and they've reported regressions for some Android workloads that they care about as they go from, say, uh, 419 to 61 kernels. And, you know, we were not doing a good job of tracking regressions. Uh, we, we, were doing, we were doing a lot of work within a kernel branch, but we weren't really looking at regressions from one branch to a newer branch. And so we've started doing that and, and encouraging our partners to do the same. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get, get a lot of help in place to make this as smooth a process as possible, but our partners are gonna have to do uh, up revs of the kernel version in the field. So uh, I don't know how much time I have for discussion, but I, I huh? Okay, good. So I wanted to throw the discussion open of, of what, for those of you who are gonna be dealing with this, if you have devices out there, what is scary to you about this? And what can we do to help? And um, what would you like to see? We have, you know, it's, it's really starting with next year's devices because they're gonna have the shorter kernel lifetime. So the devices that ship next year are probably gonna need an up rev in two or three years. So there's a little bit of a runway to do stuff. Um, Questions, comments? Yeah. Obviously, from my perspective, I work at the Android, I work at the Amazon devices organization. And from my perspective, it's all of the, uh, all of the extra drivers that the SOC vendors are adding. I'm not so concerned about the kind of the code they, they add into the GKI hooks, but it's, I mean, we get a steaming pile of ABI, of, of binary drivers from those SOC vendors. How are we gonna work with those SOC vendors to make sure those drivers get ABI updated to the new kernels? And how are we gonna actually get any, get them to do any validation when they make zero dollars off of that work? Yeah, so that's where we've been spending a lot of our time is talking to at least the major SOC vendors um, and, and dealing with that question. So for most of them, I can't talk about precisely what each of them are doing because they all take slightly different approaches, but, but the general idea is that they're gonna update their, their BSP probably on a two or three year cadence so that you as a customer of, of, of an SOC vendor, you'll see them come out and you'll, you, can, you can ask them the question because they should be able to talk to you about it now but you'll see from them uh, an updated BSP that goes from say 6.6 to 6.18 or whatever after about two or three years and they can probably give you the date of when that will happen. So then you as a OEM or as the, the next level on the chain, you should have a completely validated, tested 
ESP that you can then take your drivers and rebase them to the new kernel target. And the other question is AOSP versus Android. Is this all Android work or is this also falling back into AOSP? Um, so this is, it, it, this is really not, it's AOSP in the sense that we publish our kernels in AOSP, but, but what you're really seeing happening is we, we still have our 6.6 kernel there and there'll be a 6.18 kernel there and you will be moving from that, that 6.6 kernel to the 6.18 kernel, that's an AOSP. And, and then you know, our silicon partners who, you're, who's, who is your vendor, they're, they're using that, they're using AOSP uh, based, you know, those AOSP based kernels and platform code to, to give you what you need. So I, I, think, I think we've covered your case, but you need to talk to the, the silicon vendor. And then if you have concerns and questions, uh, did I put, let me see if I put, uh, no, I didn't, okay. Uh, so, so you can, if you have a relationship with Google and can file bugs, you can file a bug, but you can also, we have a email alias kernel, uh, kernel-team at android.com. And if you have concerns or questions or, or ways that you're, you think that your silicon vendor isn't supporting what you need to make this happen, then you can uh, hit us with that email. You're, you're talking about taking, get, getting vendors to move to newer kernels and their devices, but you're not doing that yourself. I have a Pixel 7 in my hand. I bought it 534 days ago. It's still running a 5.10 kernel. So why? Uh, how so it's so it's really starting. So we we first announced seven year support with Pixel 8. So if you have an older Pixel, it's it's not in this new regime yet. Pixel 8 is. Pixel 9 is. But and so we are doing it ourselves. But we're not going back and doing it with the older devices. Other questions, concerns? Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear us? I don't think we can hear you. You're on mute still. Just right now? Yeah, we can hear you. You're loud, though. Yeah, you're very loud. Okay. I can pull it down. No better? Is it better now? Hello? Okay, I, I don't hear you now. Yep. Okay. I. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm Sherban Konstantinescu. Um, I used to be a Googler uh, working very closely with Todd and the rest of the team on longevity. Uh, and I've recently uh, left to start Source of Dev with David, also ex Googler, uh, partner in crime, uh, working on making some of the tools that uh, you would need to uh, support software for longer. Um, so, um, together with my colleague Luca Weiss from um, Fairphone, we're going to talk through some of the other problems that you would have with uh, device longevity uh, besides the kernel and uh, the work that Todd talked about. 
So, um, first of all, just two aspects on longevity. As you've seen from the audience, uh, longevity is not just something that the regulators want, uh, it's actually something that users want. And there's a yearly uh, GSMA survey, and you could see that in 2023, the top uh, drivers for purchasing the next smartphone were actually longevity related. Um, you can find the slides online and take a look at what the survey says. Um, but users do buy longevity. Um, and we're actually seeing that this is the case not just for smart, uh, smartphones. Uh, people do the same when they, when they look at cards and uh, probably they're gonna do the same when they look at TVs and other form factors. Um, second, um, regulators are actually planning on enforcing uh, long-term software security uh, for devices. Uh, it's not just smartphones and tablets. Uh, that's what they're starting with. Uh, EU eco-design that Todd mentioned comes into effect 20th of June next year. Um, but there's regulation that covers IoT. Uh, there's regulation that covers automotive. Uh, there's regulation that covers medical devices. And all of those countries that you see there are working to some degree on their own regulation, uh, much, much of which uh, we're hoping to standardize. Uh, so we're also working closely with them on educating and uh, trying to make sure that that regulation is not just gonna fragment uh, your work further. Um, but on, on a whole, our regulation says that devices should be supported for more than five years. Um, in the smartphone space, uh, this could actually end up being seven years uh, if you sell a device for two years. Um, these devices should get timely security updates, uh, so within four months of uh, public disclosure of a vulnerability, uh, that vulnerability should be fixed in field. Uh, they should get frequent OS upgrades uh, for, uh, for EU eco design. Uh, that's uh, six months after um, some sort of release of a new uh, operating system, you should apply that. Uh, there should be a comprehensive understanding of uh, the supply chain uh, and what gets integrated in that device. And there's also talk about, of a standardized vulnerability management system. If you look at this, even in the smartphone space, it's actually quite fragmented. I think uh, Google and Pixel and Samsung and, and probably Apple uh, are state of the art in terms of vulnerability reporting. So, We've, um, uh, we at Google used, worked on this for uh, over two years, um, but we also talked with a lot of you folks. Um, we've done surveys, we've done a live stream that's linked there. Uh, we've done one-to-one -one conversations. Uh, and these are some of the issues that um, are top of mind for you. Um, and the rest of the session is mostly a Q&A trying to look at how we can resolve some of those issues. So um, the first one is, you've, we've already discussed, is that um, there are a lot of binary only BSPs um, and also a lot of the modifications that are done with OSP uh, are probably not done with longevity in mind. Uh, I think as we get uh, code generation tools, um, there are surveys out there that say that the quality of that code that gets generated is actually poorer than it was to be, uh, it used to be before. Um, so I think it's very important not to end up with this rotten Android, uh, and we should think about it from the get-go. Uh, there are many interfaces that Android provides. Uh, Treble has obviously been there for ages. Uh, it's actually tremendously helpful, um, but there's still many devices out there, uh, maybe outside of the smartphone space, that don't use this. Uh, so we should probably start with that. Uh, we should also uh, probably uh, take a look more closely at the vendor interface. And actually, if you attended uh, Chris Simmons' talk on, on the build systems, on the Android build system, uh, one of the questions that came up there is, how should we maintain devices for the long term? Um, this is an interface that um, is probably now, thought is it four years old, vendor interface? Yeah, okay, more than that. Um, so basically what the vendor interface says is that there's a decoupling between the BSP uh, and the upper layer of the operating system and that uh, Google takes on the compatibility management. So if you have a, a vendor interface that's uh, say Android 14, then uh, 
Google would cover 40 years and maybe looking at extended that, uh, extending that. Uh, so you should definitely take a look at the SOCs that have that. Any other thoughts on how we could tackle these uh, problems? Or to Todd's point, uh, maybe some of the tools that are missing. So uh, one, one way to tackle this better would be to have vendors push everything upstream. <laughs> um, obviously, not everyone's going to do that and for not every component. But over time, I think it would make sense to try and um, you know, reduce the size of these BSPs. And I, I think that makes maintenance easier for the SOC developers, it makes maintenance easier for the OEMs and the, the operating system uh, distributors. Um, so that's something I'm always harassing Todd about. Like, and, uh, as, as the Chrome OS team moves into Android, this is something that, that we're going to be pushing on as well. And of course, our model is, is kind of weird because we're going to be acting as the OS distributor and maintainer rather than the OEMs. Um, and so we're going to be really affected by this. So I'm definitely pushing, pushing vendors to push things upstream to, to save, save trouble. I do worry about you know, major Android version upgrades and having a, a, a BSP that's that's old, compatible, but old, and thus missing support for maybe new HAL extensions or something like that. Um, I, I do wor worry about getting stuck in that situation, but I don't know how to, I don't know if people have good answers on how to address that. But. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, I have a Pixel A Pro that I probably worked on uh, while I was at Google. Um, it runs approximately 120 million lines of code in pretty much every programming language that you can think of. Um, if you extrapolate forward what a Pixel 5 would have had if it was to be supported up until today, 50% of the code that would be running today on that device would be new code that that device didn't originally ship with. So, so to your point, um, I think the more of this code is upstream, right, the more you, uh, the, the lesser you pay on that maintenance tax. And really the call to action here is uh, think more about that and uh, help, help let, let's help each other figure out uh, what, what tools are missing or um, what practices are missing to be able to do that. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, and Luca, please feel free to jump in. Okay, um, the other obvious thing is um, the regulation, at least for smartphones, says uh, that you should be updating, uh, fixing security patches uh, within four months or its upgrades within six months. Uh, that's probably not going to apply everywhere, but uh, a lot of the IoT regulation that's coming in 2026, 2027 is probably going to inherit at least the security uh, timelines uh, here. So really, the model we have today with multiple development branches doesn't really scale. Um, Actually, even at Google, um, Android is moving to a new development mo model called Trunk Stable. Uh, it used to be that the months of uh, January, February, and uh, March, we would get really bu buggy dog food devices uh, because we would try to sta stabilize the code base. Um, and, and really, um, the, the way to maybe deal with some of that is to, to move to the, this new development model where actually you have one branch uh, would use flagging, uh, would use uh, the, the Android tools that exist, um, and, and uh, develop things behind flags rather than have multiple branches for supporting each one of those. Um, and that could ease some of the testing costs, uh, could ease some of the security patching costs, and could actually enable you to go faster to the Nest OS, OS upgrade. Um, so yeah, there's probably, I think at scale, uh, there are very few people that actually track, um, a very, very few companies that actually track what's happening in Android uh, at a very granular basis. Very few people that probably track what's happening with uh, the uh, work that Greg and Todd are doing uh, with the Android kernels. Um, and maybe that's a way to actually detect issues earlier when they come in. and. Uh, go and, and, and work with, it, with the teams upstream on, on fixing those. Um, so really, we think that there's a lot of DevOps that's, uh, that's missing here, uh, and then that this might actually help you. Any other thoughts on how we could better deal with this, or like what's some of the tooling that's missing? I think one, one thing I was also mentioning before was that uh, 
basically tr um, trunk stable also needs support from the SOC vendor. So if the SOC vendor only gives um, a certain end version um, there, then uh, then also the OEM, the OEM is kind of stuck on on the on the version that the that the SOC vendor provides. So it needs support from both sides really. Like the, both the OEMs updating to the new version from the suppliers and the supplier actually updating it. I do realize that I haven't properly introduced Luca. Um, for for those that, of you that don't know, Fairphone is probably the company out there that supports the longest lasting Android devices to date. Uh, and they really last for a long time. Uh, it's not just the software, actually the, the, the hardware. Um, we we're talking primarily about the software here, but the hardware is also a big component to being, being able to last uh, so long. And actually a lot of the regulation is also uh, talking about um, hardware cycles and um, improvements there as well. Okay. So um, another fun fact about my Pixel 8 is that um, it also incorporates 20 or 30 other providers. Um, and this is just like a generic number. Uh, you've seen some of the supply chain attacks, but actually the supply chain for smartphones or uh, cars, it's actually quite complex. You don't end up just working with the SOC and the OEM and the ODM. Uh, there are probably 20 or 30 other companies that you need to work with that do anything from the fingerprint provider to the audio chip to uh, maybe something small on the side, uh, maybe the camera hull, um, maybe the camera framework. Um, so uh, you, you should, I, I think, those are also folks and, and companies that need to think about uh, long-term software support because updating the devices would also involve uh, work that needs to happen at their end, at least testing that needs to happen at their end. I think I've heard of an uh, example where the device was supported for a long time, but the NFC chip wasn't, and there were all sorts of issues with that, uh, especially when moving forward to Android releases. Um, there are all sorts of other problems like that. Um, so it's not just the folks in this room that need to think about this. It's also the folks that you folks work with uh, that probably need to think about this. Um, and again, I think the only silver bullet there is just to figure out the way to more continuously track this uh, upstream changes on a more granular basis than they do today, um, just so that when, when issues get introduced, issues get detected and, and probably fixed to some degree. Um, look, anything to add here? I think not, maybe from the audience. audience. Anyone else in the audience that has any particular war story to share here or um, tool that magically saved them or any other thing? Hi. Um, um, I just, I just want to bring up one other thing, which is automotive, which is going to uh, compound this problem by, by several factors. Uh, so automotive um, hardware is, is in the market for uh, 10 years or more. So what are you going to do when you need a 12-year, an 18-year support cycle? Um, it's a problem that uh, we all have, but it's a problem that has to be solved somehow. Um, otherwise, we can have people driving around in buggy cars, and we don't want that. And w the only thing I'll add to that is what Todd said at the beginning, like you should bear in mind that many of these risks are not just theoretical, they do happen, uh, and they do happen at scale, and they will continue to happen uh, if we don't fix these devices and keep them updated. Um, any other thoughts? And I guess probably everyone in this room is aware of it, but I have the urgent request that all the uh, device makers at least make the source for their uh, drivers and uh, firmware and things available. I've been trying to keep a Nexus 6P alive for about 12 years. The hardware survived it, and uh, I could update it to newer Android releases even, but, uh, but at some point it became impossible to keep the, uh, a couple of stupid binary blobs going, at which point the device became worthless. So. It should really be a requirement that, uh, that uh, at least the uh, key to, uh, drivers and things are open sourced 
or at least in a source available license so people can port them to newer releases as needed. Yeah. Um, my product manager hat on now. I think this is, uh, to a large scale, a supply and demand problem. The, today, there is there doesn't exist a lot of supply for uh, the, the lot, a lot of demand for software updates besides folks like Fairphone and many others of you here. Um, but the regulation is going to encourage that, and I do hope that people are going to be more upstream friendly as a, as a result of that. Uh, just a plug, kind of related. I don't know if everyone's aware of it, but the um, the firmware update project has been a pretty good success story. And it's not really in the Android ecosystem yet. I'm hoping we can push it in, but um, but that's a place where vendors have been pretty willing to to work on um, adding what's necessary for getting their device firmwares updated by by the uh, system. So if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's a good thing. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll move on to uh, this this last slide. So there's a lot of regulation that's coming. Um, don't think that the regulation is not going to impact your devices if they're internet connected. If they if they are internet connected, they will be impacted sooner or later. Uh, UK PSTI is already into effect. Um, if you look at uh, you could you could ask me uh, after the the meeting and I could show you how. Um, bad that looks, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, in terms of like uh, not the requirements, but in terms of like the software supply chain where it is today, uh, EU Eco Design is coming into effect uh, 20th of June next year, and there's a lot of laws um, coming up, uh, primarily from the European Union and others on this topic. Um, and and yeah, you should you should probably consider uh, maybe reading those regulations or or thinking a little bit about it. Um, there's a cheat sheet here at the end. I don't expect you to be able to read this, um, but this is like some of the regulation that you should have in mind and um, some of the wording in there uh, and, and some of the impact. Uh, as Chris said, there are actually form factors uh, where the uh, support required by some of this regulation is gonna be vastly exceeding those five-year mark. Um, for example, for maybe cards are a good example. Uh, where the regulation says that you provide software updates uh, for the intended lifetime of that device. Um, so yeah, get, please ask me or some of my colleagues or Todd or some of the other folks that are thinking about this if you need any help. Thank you. I also want to mention that uh, Karim from OpenSource has been uh, very important in, in getting this all set up and especially running the live stream. Can, I, can you use this microphone? Okay, I'll use this one. Okay, so um, next topic. Uh, I want to talk about communities. Yeah. Um, so, statement of the problem. Uh, ASP is used in many different types of devices, uh, some of which we have mentioned. Most of these um, people, uh, groups rather, are developing their own customized versions of ASP, um, some of them licensing from Google, some of them not. So consequently, we know for sure there's a large group of developers out there working on AOSP. Um, so uh, we, I did a, a rough uh, calculation about this. It's somewhere between tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. So it's not a small group of people. Uh, but where are they? It's like the Fermi paradox, but for software engineers. Fermi paradox, ask me later. Um, Contrast this with other open source projects that do similar things. So I'm, I'm picking on Yocto project here as being uh, a good counterexample. Yocto does essentially the same as what AOSP does, but in a different way. Um, so they have a vibrant and open uh, community. Um, so essentially, I'd like to have the same, please. Um, community then is more than just free code. It's not a free download. It is sharing, communicating, contributing. That's what I mean. So 
to elaborate that a little bit then, the problem is the way that AOSP developers work. Um, everyone is an island. Everyone's working together, uh, sorry, working alone on their, their, their problem or in small teams or whatever. Little communication between teams, even in the same company, they frequently don't. Little opp opportunity to get together with others. Little sense of there being a community at all. So everybody's on their little island, they don't see the other islands around. Even with that telescope, you still can't see the islands across the sea. Just drilling down a little bit on this uh, community thing. Um, yeah, community means sharing information. It's not just downloading stuff to get the maximum benefit out of open source. Uh, it's about sharing. It's about asking questions, replying to questions, sharing useful information, um, and all those things. So uh, I guess you could ask then, why hasn't this happened? If this is such a, such a great idea, why don't we just do it? And I've come to realize that uh, community isn't necessarily something which just happens organically. It needs something, it needs some focus. It needs some kind of leadership to coordinate and promote all this stuff. Why is community a good idea? Um, I've said some of these things already. Uh, but I want to focus on the win-win the part of this, just to emphasize that community is not a threat to OEMs. Uh, so community uh, works, the, the idea of sharing uh, works both for the individual, because you get to share stuff, you get to uh, recognition within the community, which is a nice thing. We all like to get recognition. Uh, it works within the team because you get, uh, if you're a product manager or a product owner, um, you get benefit of scale, you get benefit of people uh, becoming better at their jobs. Um, we talked about upstreaming just now, the more of this stuff that can be upstream, the better. And again, don't be afraid of upstreaming. Uh, upstreaming is a good idea. Just do more of it. And you know who I'm talking about here. Um, and then, at the company level, yeah, again, open source is not a threat. It is not stealing your intellectual property, because this is all open source anyhow. Um, it is reducing your exposure to open source by sharing it and sharing the maintenance of all of that. So this is all good stuff. And uh, just a note at the bottom there, uh, I'm talking to you, Google. This applies to you as much as anyone else. So contrast this then with um, Yocto. So I, I happen to work quite a lot with Yocto people. I know the Yocto project pretty well. And like I say, fundamentally, Yocto does the same thing as AOSP. How do they do it? Well, it's quite a small community, I should say. There's not a particularly huge number of people there. Uh, but they have mail lists. They have people answering those mail lists. If you ask a question on the uh, one of the Octo mail lists, you'll get a response usually within 24 hours, quite often less than that. They are open to patches. We can send patches to uh, the Open Embedded and Yocto people, and they will be very receptive to that. They have Dev Day conferences. They had one yesterday, in fact, in this very building. Um, they have advocates for the community. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about uh, Josef Holzmeier, who I'm sure you all know. He does a tremendously good job at promoting the, um, the, the Yocto community. And they are set up. They have an open decision-making process. They have a, tiering, uh, a technical steering committee. Uh, all this stuff is made public. So the whole thing is done in the open. Everybody has a part of this. What do we have? Uh, so right now, uh, well, from Google, what do Google give us? Not a lot. We have some Google groups, uh, but nobody ever answers any of the mails there. They are basically useless. What about the organic community? So there's a bunch of stuff on Stack Overflow. Quite often when I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem to something, I'll, I'll Google it and <laughs> Google it. I'll search for it, and um, it will point me to Stack Overflow. Some of the information there in there is good. Some of it is not so good. Um, we have a meetup. So I, myself, run a meetup every two months. And that is a, 
uh, a means which is somewhat successful to get people to talk together. Uh, we have the ASP developers community, um, um, which uh, I think was started by uh, John Stoltz and a bunch of others, and a bunch of people uh, here from Bay Libra and from Linaro and many other places use that as a means of communication. Cool. We have various uh, podcasts. I'm looking at the ADB, the Android Developers Backstage, uh, Chet Haas, and a bunch of other people now. Not specifically AOSP, although they frequently impinge on AOSP-type uh, topics. And we have occasional ad hoc meetings at various conferences, including Plumbers, as we are here right now, uh, but also at the Media Learners Conference, uh, Linaro Connect, uh, DroidCon, particularly Dro DroidCon Berlin. If you happen to drop by that, there's a lot of low-level stuff going on there. Um, Slide two of two. Um, when I was researching this, I came across this website, Awesome Android AOSP, which I hadn't come across before. It's basically a li very long list of links to almost everything you can imagine. A lot of it is way out of date, but it is worth a look. And then we have various uh, community support um, around various bits of hardware. So. Around boards, we have the Glowdroid community, we have the various Raspberry Pi uh, groups, um, and likewise around uh, custom ROMs and, and, and uh, things like the Fairphone, uh, we have groups, each, develop, each uh, serving those particular communities, but they have the open source ethos to a large extent. It would be great to, to share more with these guys. So what could we do? Um, I mean, we could do nothing, but that's not really an option in my opinion. There's a bunch of stuff we could do which doesn't actually require a huge amount of effort. Um, so we could um, set up storage places to store stuff. So right now there's a GitHub page I have. Um, there's the thing that uh, at linaro.org that um, uh, Amit has, uh, has uh, set up. Uh, we could do some kind of communication channels. So we have the, uh, the matrix channel that the Android developers uh, people have. We could do some social media behind this. And then we could do with some online uh, meetings and maybe even uh, in-person meetings. Most of this stuff we do already. It's just it's kind of fragmented. I'd like to kind of focus this and bring it all together a little bit. And all of us in this room, we can all become advocates for the idea of an open source Android uh, AOSP community. And maybe we should lobby Google uh, to take us a bit more seriously. So finally then, and hopefully I've got a few minutes left, discussion. I would like to have a discussion with the people in this room and the people not in this room uh, about what we can do about this. So quick fixes we talked about already. There's a bunch of stuff we could do with, with almost no effort. Um, things that need some effort, well, the leadership thing, it needs uh, somebody or preferably a group of somebody's uh, to volunteer to do some stuff. And I guess since I'm standing here, I'm kind of offering my services here. Things that could require substantial effort. So if you did do this properly, we would need to set up a separate uh, organization, a not-for-profit not of some kind, get some sponsorship, get some, get some uh, funding, uh, and so on and so on. So there's kind of three levels of menu here. So I'm going to open this out to anybody who wants to say anything. What do you think? What can we do? Is this a good idea? Go. Okay, it's kind of quiet. So I think it's a very good idea, but I think there's two big blockers that we cannot really solve at the moment. One is the gatekeeper problem, and uh, you cannot really get code into AOSP unless you have t uh, two reviewers, uh, as most of us have probably noticed. And it's impossible to get anything past those reviewers that is not in line with Google's ideas. So, for example, if you want to use AOSP in a context that doesn't matter, uh, that doesn't match their vision of uh, where it should be, like for example, you want to use it in a headless system or whatever that is no, uh, not in the plans, there uh, there's no chance whatsoever it will be accepted. And 
there should really be more open repositories. Ideally, the, it would return to something more like what was planned in the beginning with the Open Handset Alliance, where there's more different organizations uh, in control of it. Okay, I mean, and that would be nice, but that's, that's not gonna happen, and I don't ever expect that to happen. But there's still stuff that's worthwhile doing. We can augment AOSP by creating our own repositories which append to AOSP. So one, one of the principles I think would be never fork AOSP. That's, that's, um, that's an insane thing to do. But you can work around AOSP. You can add to it in non-invasive ways and maybe add in some patches. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh couple of things I think you mentioned that already the at the last plumbers we started talking about the dev boards for Android yep. part the dot .org is incidental it was easier for us to manage but the idea was that we could have uh, developers around ASP that could come together and talk specifically about dev boards that support ASP so uh, one thing we were able to do with that, and it's like an open invitation if anybody wants to collaborate, we have a get it. So we are able to have uh, an ASP style development workflow there. Mm. So there is get it, there is GitHub. Uh, you can push patches, we can follow the same process as ASP. That's one. The other part is that we envision uh, with proper support from the community, we could have that as a placeholder for common health that can be very useful for people doing almost the same thing, or maybe the same kind of socks. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah let's do it. And then there is a hash ASP developers on uh, IRC. Mm -hmm. That's already there, and I think it's mm -hmm. fairly yep. active. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, it's a little bit active, I would say. It could be more active, let's put it that way. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with you in that we need more effort on this. Yeah. So, yeah. And I would like to raise this as being an issue that we can tackle, rather than just saying, hey, it's, we can never win against Google. We can, we can surround Google. We can, we can partition Google. Sorry, I, that's, that came out wrong. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering, and, and I know the, the regulations vary by country, I'm most familiar with the regulations for nonprofits in the U.S., but if you were to um, um, be part of an organization um, in the U.S., there's a difference between um, 501c6, that is trade associations, um, which are, uh, uh, um, which work in the interest of their member companies, and there, there's 501c3s, which work in the interest of the public good, and I'm just wondering if you see one of those models fitting better uh, for this sort of project? Jeez. Um, I guess it kind of fill, falls between the two. I mean, fundamentally, I'm looking at it from the, pod, uh, the, the public good uh, aspect. Um, us being the public, and uh, we have a need to come together in some way. But I can see also a value of this being uh, viewed as a trade association, as a way of expanding it out of just individual developers, and ideally we'd like OEMs to be involved. We'd like to be uh, the SOC vendors, the board vendors. We'd like the whole ecosystem to be, ecosystem to be involved at some point. Um, so yeah, m maybe it's more towards the Troy Dissociation part of it, but I, this, 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 this is a detail that would need to be sorted out if we were to go to the next step. For sure, yeah, thanks. Just uh, making sure it's on the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. got you. Um, maybe just a quick side note here. I, I think this kind of like looks as as uh, Google versus the rest of the world. But um, to Google's credit, um, it, Google is actually helping a lot with this. Like Android is so successful because Google is building awesome tools and investing in a com community of application developers, right? Like we wouldn't be here talking about using in an Android and all these other form factors if it wasn't for that. And that community is very successful and will continue to be successful. And I think w what's missing is an equivalent community at the platform level. And I would say that maybe in some cases it's not just like Google that um, 
didn't help with getting this form. It's also kind of what you said, those many small islands that don't want to speak to each other. Um, and there are many places where actually nobody differentiates on some aspects. And actually, if we were to work together, um, I think I think that would help. So I, I, I think <coughs> it's, uh, yes, we definitely want Google part of this. And that's kind of what we're saying. But we're also saying good, that we good want point. Yeah. the rest of, the, of you folks uh, to be part of this. And if you were to be part of it, then uh, Google would probably uh, be part of it as well in, to some degree. So um, maybe a, a call to action to us all uh, in the room uh, besides. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I would like to just, just uh, amplify that. Yeah, I, I, at no point do I want to be antagonistic towards Google, even though I may have said a few things by accident just now. I did not mean them. Um, but so, I mean, Google are the good guys here. They, they produce this huge chunk of code which is used by billions and billions of people. So it's a good thing. Um, whereas other phone manufacturers don't open source their code, and so we can't make uh, clones of those. So I'm not belittling anything uh, that's done here. I'm just saying that there is a little bit that is missing from the whole uh, jigsaw, and um, that's the bit that I, would, I think we could f um, fill in if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems one of your primary users, if you made this happen, would be the uh, alternative firmware communities like Lineage. I'm most familiar with Lineage OS, but there's there's many of them. Um, and my observation of them is they don't really operate much like a traditional open source and free software project the way we would see it. They, they, they just have a totally different community aspect and the way that they release, the way that they communicate. Uh, I mean, I, I can never, I have to go on XDA forums whenever I have to a find a question which are like impossible to use with all the ads and everything. So I'm wondering if you've thought about how you do that community building, because that's going to be a key piece of your user base, these people who don't really, they want to do open source, they want to do a, you know an alternative to, to, a, to Google. Um, because they're supporting devices that Google doesn't support anymore a lot of the times. Uh, but, uh, but they're just such a different community that's so removed from, like, I, I don't know if there's anybody here from those communities, but I suspect not. They don't come to things like Plumber. So I'm curious if you thought that through of how to build, um, build, that, build those bridges that we'll, we'll definitely need. Uh, good point. I mean, I, I don't have any visibility of those communities. Um, but if anybody, I mean, they would be great people to have on board. I have not investigated how, how that would happen. But yeah, great idea. Um, just a quick point on, the, on that. I've um, uh, been at this conference now for probably 10 years or, or on and off. And if you look at the agenda, the agenda is very much driven by, by Google, right? And this is an open source community. Everyone can contribute topics. Why aren't there topics from other folks, right? Android is modified in so many ways. So I, 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 I think we should probably get our um, community straight first and, and try to contribute some more, uh, try to come here with topics that uh, you struggle with, discuss about them, figure out how we can stop them. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm out of time here. Just one final thing I'd like to say. If you would like to follow through with this, please um, contact me directly, or preferably put your email into the matrix chat for this, uh, this, this dev room. And I aim to put together some kind of proposal that we can share uh, amongst ourselves and see if we can take this to the next stage. Thank you all very much.